hope you everyone can see the right screen. Yes. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Max. I'm the tech lead at SoftServe. And today we're going to go on a journey to determine who is NetDevops, why such position is needed, why it's always network, if, even if you don't expect it, as the recent Facebook event show us once again, actually. So let's firstly talk, talk about agenda. For today, we'll declare what's the problem of static network in the dynamic application, take a look at the Yank model, declare what's NetConf, what is RefsConf, talk a bit about NetApp's tool set, and connect to the SDNs, the huge mystery which is currently happening in the DevOps and Net DevOps world. And also small Q&A session. Sadly, we don't have a demo for today, but I hope you can try, try this thing out by yourself later on. So let's firstly <coughs> declare who NetApps is, because NetApps is a huge part of Net DevOps. As some of you might interact with NetApps on a daily basis. Some of you might never heard about them. So no surprise, NetPod in this stands for network. And these people who create, support, improve existing network setup. Everybody see NetApps in their own unique way. <clears throat> but actually it's a lot of firefighting and also fire prevention, but also building like really complex systems. <laughs> That's mostly the net, the NetApps part. So as the net, network exists to provide connectivity for application, we should take a step back and look how this are evolving. Agile microservice, cloud native developments, DevOps automation process with CICD pipelines, automated testing, like all these things enable really dynamic application development for quick time to time to market requirements. Let's not forget that software is one of the most important assets to differentiate model enterprise for their comp competition. So being able to quickly implement new features, deploy new locations, fix issues is about the key to successful business. So for last year, service has been virtualized with virtual machines so they could be deployed in minutes. These days, such trends are moving to the container-based deployments, which are like insanely fast. There are short lives entities that might be deployed dynamically across hybrid cloud environments and tracing amount them provide the desired service with virtual, like literally unlimited scalability and adapting to any possible issues with the underlying infrastructure declaring the statements which can be changed. In comparison, network infrastructure is a bit more static. In order to accommodate requirements from application development, it needs to be a lot faster, more flexible and cost optimized. <laughs> That's a huge problem for today's network as well. Today's network integration is still mostly completely manual process that makes any desired changes in network complex and slow. Actually, the more elements in the changes, like firewalls, load balancers, switches, yada, 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 the more difficult it gets to make them quick, reliable, and adaptable. This situation often leads to like bare minimum of configuration in a network that allows for, for faster deployment. For example, there are lots of cases for no ACLs whatsoever, no quality of service config, trunking every VLAN in the interface whatsoever. And actually that's leading to a much bigger concern later on. So current state, as you can see, is not so rainbow. Like by 2020, 40% of er every changes in network was made by CLI, so fully manual process. It's still drastically <laughs> decreased from 75% of usage of CLI in 2018, but still like 40% of all the changes are made manual. So if there are 
tasks that achieved manually and it's mostly repeatable. So you'd guess it right. So open your favorite ID and let's code it. Let's con consider the simple codified process that you're trying to create for every switch in network, for every interface in switch. If interface is down and interface change was more than 30 days ago, let's shut down that interface and set the description that interface is disabled by policy. That looks like fantastic. That's how, how it should be done. It's kind of like it is, but there is lots of stuff needed to actually be able to create such processes. First of all, data models. Data models are conceptual representation of data that define the specific information needed to be included in the format to actually represent it. Data model can be assembled in multiple source application and can be communicated by different protocols. So here's come the ink. <laughs> some of them might, some of you might heard about it. Some of you might just get, get it first time, but yeah, it exists. It's a data model language defined specifically for the network devices. It's originated from a bunch of RFCs and what, how it looks. It's actually the XML files <clears throat> that describes the data model and compose of modules, submodules, which are represented by the different individual Ying files. Yen models are like self described to self documenting, self descriptive, hierarchical, and could be like really confusing for the first time you actually see it. It's based on the multiple standards from IATF, OpenConfig, and many, many others. If you're really interested in it, you definitely need to take a look on it. So it supports most of current huge vendors and allows to augment and deviate it to actually change it on the fly to your actually needed data and actually create like this vendor specific view that will, will needs to be provided. So on the right, on the right part of the screen, you can see the generic info about the Cisco IX device. As you can see, all the parts are module. There is the branches here, leaves here. Every leaves have the descriptive format, what's in there, in what format it should be. What's, uh... <clears throat> and actually it's described the whole bunch of actual parts of the network devices, as you can see, the interface, the BGPs, the quality of service, SNMP, all the features in it. So that's pretty neat. So like, okay, so you have the data model, how you can actually distribute it and actually put something onto the device. That's the next step, like generic one. So here's come the free standard way for the network, the netconf, restconf, and APIs. So netconf this is like pretty generic stuff, which are work with the SSH. <clears throat> it have like this general, pretty simple request, like get object, get config, edit config, delete config, lock and lock if needed, and actual stuff with the session. It's kind of old still, rather than SSH, it could use like older protocols like SOAP, recent, not so recently, but quite recently, they added the TLS support. So actually, if you need to secure that stuff, you can use the TLS, I think one, one to two, and that's, Pretty much it. You can just 
push it, push it up and it will work on almost any devices. The new stuff is the REST conf. REST conf is REST-like interface, which are based on the RPC, the remote procedure call, and it's provide like this generic CRUD, CRUD operation. So create, update, remove, delete, everything. And all the objects are declared on the platform side. More and more vendors are actually providing the dedicated REST APIs rather than REST calls. It provides like this additional layer of abstraction. So, but sadly, it's still like around 25% of all the vendors that are currently provided. So still most of the stuff should be used, netconf and restconf. So generally it looks something like that to make any changes in the network. If it's smaller on the smaller side, on the bigger side, it's still pretty much it. You have the restconf, you have the netconf, you have Yank as a data model, which declares what exactly should be put put it up there and HTTPS or SSH or TLS if you needs to be secure and your second teams are really annoying about it. <clears throat> so you might ask, okay, we might know how it works. How can we use it? You might guess that there is already like lots of stuff created by the open source community and enterprises. But still, there is like few bits missed to actually do something with it. So as you might know, it will declare this CMDB concept, which is like configuration management database, which will contain info about the configuration of organization. So in simpler words, it's actually all the info about hardware, software, racks, interfaces, VPN, services, all the abstraction you created, and any other thing you actually will imagine. So yeah, there is like lots of existing CMDB solutions specified for network. So some of them are service as a service solutions. Some of them are self-hosted open source solution. Some of them cost like crazy amount of money and billing you for like each entity in the CMDB. But like my favorite one is here. It's Netbox, which is like open source IRM, which can be easily actually pluggable. It's based on Python and Django, which everyone likes and loves out of hope. And it's actually have almost anything you generally need from the box. Sometimes you need to plug it up, but for medium and small infra, it's like perfect. It has everything you need. It works from the box. It's simple as hell. <laughs> and it's actually helpful with automation because it's how the one of the best API I've ever, ever seen. Device 42 is enterprise level solutions provides as a service, and it's kind of same as netbox but a bit more mature and you actually have the tech support and whatever you need it as the enterprise client service now as you know the huge in the huge spectrum of service they are provide that actually have the cmdb and there is the part with the network cmdb but it's still the claim as for me as for my opinion at least so yeah and so we have the CMDB, we got the all info, we have the game data model, which describes what exactly needs to be done. We have the, the actual processes and interfaces, which could be used to actually push the configs. And that's built up in the Python library. So that's the tool belts of the of every NetApps, at now at least. So Paramico. Paramico is just basic implementation of the SSH v2. So basically it provides you with the ability to directly push something by the netconf and get the CLI output from it. Nothing too crazy, a bit complex to understand on the lower level, but still like good enough for, for a first try to do something. 
there is the official Farcon for Amico, it's Netmico. Netmico, it's special, it's developed specially for network devices. It has the mod switching, output parser. It supports most of the vendors, like this huge one, Cisco, Juniper, Hewlett Packer, Arista, or other like Linux based distribution or whatever. So it's pretty neat. It's better than Paramica. <laughs> I recommend use it as the second a second step after Paramica. Then you'll see that Paramica is a bit limited. Where is Napalm? Napalm is the network automation and programmability abstraction layer with the multi vendor support. I need to read it out because I know <laughs> I'll never actually memorize it. So. That's the cool Python library that provides the ability to interact with different vendors with the unified API. So basically, you might have the most crazy hybrid setup you'll ever imagine. And actually, all the devices will have the single unified API, which you will talk through. It has the cool feature of actually mocking the drivers of the devices rather than just trying to trying to execute something on the end device, you can actually just mock it and actually create the test plans on your network. So basically that's the first step of creating the testable deployments and testable changes. Pretty neat stuff, no, nor near. It's the simplistic automation framework, which are actually looks, at least for me, as lots like a Ansible parent. It's provide you the ability to declare the tasks, group them, run them on the YAML declared inventories. And it kind of looks familiar for one who knows how Ansible actually works. So basically that's the parent of Ansible. It's still like support, it's supported by the open source community. It's neat, but if you need something mature, something, hugely developed by the vendors, by the community. You guess it right, you need Ansible. <laughs> it's like people's favorite configuration management system. It's not, it's already not a framework. It's the whole system which provides. There is already the Ansible tower, which gives you ability to actually simplify the access management to the playbooks, to to see directly what's running, where running, add additional schedulers whatsoever. To have lots of community enterprise create modules and plugins to what, whatever net devices you can just imagine. Like most crucial part of it is the connection plugins. So actually there is network CLI plugin, which provides the ability just to push configs directly. There is the netconf plugin, as you might guess, it's the support to the netconf, restconf plugin, Napalm plugin, which use this Napalm unified API we've talked previously, and the HTTP API, which is same copy of the URI plugin, but still the output parser, lots of like synthetic sugar you really need to work with. So yeah. Having like all these tools might be a bit overwhelming at first, but some data centers might contain like not dozens of devices, but actually dozens of racks with the full of network devices. And building like automation around it <laughs> might be really tricky, I'd say. So we know if market demands something, actually community and vendors started to work on it. <clears throat> so as you might guess, like after almost 15 years of development, Internet Engineer Task Force, ETF, I, I hope like most of you heard about it, and Stanford University, actually created the protocol which called the OpenFlow. 
OpenFlow is a brand new communication protocol that provides you the access of the forwarding plane in network switch and routers. What does it mean? So basically, it enables you to determine the path of network package across the switches and routers. It actually provides the ability to distinct it only from switches. The separation of control can forward you, can actually dis provides you a way for more sophisticated traffic management and ability to manage it directly rather than from ACLs or routing protocols. It's actually provides you the ability also to control the layer three switch packet forwarding table, provide the ability to add, modify, remove packet matching rules and destination. So it has built on DSI, D, DP, DPI, deep packet inspection. So <clears throat> based on that, actually, we've come up to the concept of SDNs. <laughs> it looks horrific on the first glance, but it's actually Creating its stuff. So SDN. SDN is software defined networks which are based mostly on the OpenFlow protocol and provides you with the ability to actually softwarely define all the components in actual network rather than having this huge like standalone servers which needs to be managed. They manage each individually. You can have the farm of servers, which will be controlled by the management layer. And actually, it looks like a lot of like Kubernetes, actually. Some of the SDN drivers actually are both being used in the Kubernetes. You might know like Calico, Flanel, is actually the SDN drivers, which are highly used in the Kubernetes itself, but also it's start to be used in open source projects to be able to control the multiple farms of the network, network devices itself. So someone might, might already know all this stuff, but I'll just keep the high part of it. So the SDN applications. As you can see, it's the programs that communicate network requirements and desire network behavior with the SDN controllers via no, no bound interfaces. It can consume the abstraction view of network, as you can see. So basically, it consumes how networks look right now and what is the desired state. Like the all infrastructure as a code stuff. <clears throat> and actually putting all the changes through the NBI agent. SDN controller is the centralized entity that translates the requirements of application down to the database. So basically here. <clears throat> and actually that's the like brain of SDN, which known how to actually transform the config drift, for example, to actual implemented parts in the infrastructure, where it's needed, how it needs to be done, in which order, yada, yada. Data path. <clears throat> so data path is the logical device which expose visibility and control all the data processing pipelines. So basically that's the data pipeline of this whole application. SDP, SDPI, control pipeline interface. It's the interface defined by the SDN controller and path, which provides at least programmatic control of the forwarding operation, 
capabilities of advertisement, it's PGP or other routing protocols, static reporting, or actually getting the info about the current network setup, event notification. I think that's pretty much it. Uh, one of the value like, like here is that the SDN could actually use SDPI and implementation on different vendors. So basically you don't need to have this, this, don't have need this one vendor lock environment. If you have the CDN, the CDPI implementation could be distributed to different vendors and, I, and you actually can have this crazy hybrid environment. I didn't see one by myself, but in theory, you can have it. Most of production environments are still a bit locked to the single vendor because of money and all the business, but yeah. In theory, you can do it. <clears throat> and NBI is the interface between the application and controller which provides the abstract network view and provide the direct expression of network behavior and requirements. So basically, yeah, that's it. Currently existing SDNs. As you may guess, SDN is the huge part of the currently developed system. Most of them are being actually developed by the huge corporation, which are providing, no surprise, network equipment or network services like Cisco, like VMware, like Juniper. Most of them are mostly vendor specified. Okay, we've talked with SDNI, you can actually have this hybrid environment, but, but most of this implementation actually locked to the one or two vendors, mostly. I've myself worked mostly on the Cisco products, so it, but it took me like weeks to actually get like this basic understanding how it works, not going even deeper on the Linux and all the encapsulations actually being done on the SDN level. So, as you understand, there is, so as you may guess, there is this way to actually manage the biggest data centers and the most complex setup you can ever imagine. So I'd guess some of you might notice that there is no net DevOps here. The topic of the whole presentation is like, that DevOps, what is it? But I've actually been tricked to you because all the stuff we've previously discussed is actually the part of adoption from the NetApps to the NetApps. NetApps is still like moving forward from static processes being done manually to this more dynamic changes which are done like daily, which are finally kind of overgrowing this cult of fear. <laughs> All of you might know this lots of memes about the net network part that in most cases it's rather the DNS of the network. <laughs> and in most cases it's actually true. So basically it's created this known culture of fear around the network changes because they are becoming bigger, they're becoming more complex, they always not always, but often brings up some problem into existing infrastructures needs to be fixed. People being afraid of changing something because of that, and it's and doing less changes because of that. Actually, all the stuff I showed you previously is actually the process of minimizing it, doing changes more frequently, optimizing some stuff. Testing it out, actually manage it from one place as FDN show us. And yeah, we hope, I hope at least finally, like NetDevops could actually change 
yeah, let's let's say Net, NetOps will eventually evolve into NetDevops and already have the lots of <clears throat> cases such the words happened. So I hope I raised the curtain a bit about what's currently happening in the NetOps world, where it's going and what's uh, my, my view of what needs to be done with the network. I hope that was at least interesting and not boring. Maybe you have some like, cool stories with the NetOps, uh, probably even NetDevs, or maybe have some questions. Let's talk about it.